Hey folks, welcome to the first Lioness community event. My name is Bobby Carlton. I am the founder of Innovation Women. I'm also the editor-in-chief and publisher of Lioness Magazine. Lioness Magazine is your source for everything needed to start and run your company. We've got guides, interviews, and all kinds of how-tos. And now we are starting up a program of community events. So before we get started, if you are interested in Lioness Magazine and you're not already a subscriber, we'd like to give you a little gift. You can get an annual subscription to Lioness Magazine for just $12 a year. And on top of that, that $12 subscription rate is yours forever. So if you want to join Lioness and you're not already a member, lionessmagazine.com, special offer for you with dashes in between. And we're putting that information right into the chat for you today. We also would like to invite you to join our next community event. If you're interested, our next event is going to be Lioness Networking. So instead of a webinar where you don't have the opportunity to talk to other Lioness members, you will have an opportunity to meet with other Lionesses. We're doing that on March 21st as part of our Lioness community events from noon to 1 p.m. Eastern time. And now I'd like to get us started by introducing our special guest today. Samantha Stone is, I would say, a personal friend of mine, and she is also the author of one of my favorite marketing books. And this book is called Unleash Possible. Samantha is a growth marketing specialist, and she is here today to help you with your marketing. Samantha, take it away. Oh, I'm so grateful to be here, Bobby. I'm really great for our friendship over the years and for the amazing communities that you bring together. It is your superpower to do that. So it is really fun to be here today to talk about a serious topic, right? Talk about something a lot of us are challenged with. And uh, I'm excited to do that. If you wanna go to the first slide, one of the things that we are challenged with is the, the environment we're operating in. Fuel costs are not at their peak highest, but they still remain high. There's still turmoil um, in the Ukraine. There's a lot of inflation that is happening around us. And in the technology sector alone, there has been more than 100,000 layoffs. So there is just a lot happening that's going on. And the reality is there's debates about whether we're actually going to be entering a recession or not, and if we are, how long it will last. But what we do know for certain is that our buyers are nervous and the markets overall are um, uncertain about what's happening. And so we have to plan for that as we look into the next few months ahead and make sure that our businesses are ready for that. I'd like to go to the next slide, please. Um, before I talk too much, I'd love to do a quick poll and just get a sense for those of you who are joining us today how you're feeling about your business right now and how things are. You'll see that poll up there. Uh, I encourage you to figure this, take that out. Uh, and then we'll just give folks a moment to do that. And I'll be curious to get your, get your feedback. I sort of been running this informal poll for the last few weeks. And I can tell you informally and from an ad hoc perspective, um, three months ago, people were feeling more optimistic than they are today. Um, so I'll be curious to get your feedback as well. And Bobby will let us know when we get enough folks in there to close that out. Absolutely. We just have a few more people to participate in that and we can close Perfect. that out. All right. I think we are at the end here. Thank Excellent. You, folks. I look forward to seeing the results. Well, this is really interesting. So we definitely, um, the majority of pe people have seen some slowdown in their business. I've seen that in my own and I'm planning for that. Uh, the good news is there's not a lot of people who are seeing a major miss or projecting that um, 
one really lucky, a couple lucky people are seeing a real booming. Sometimes slowdowns and uncertainty are good for some businesses. It's something that actually to fuel growth. Um, thanks for sharing your perspective. And we can go to the next slide, Bobby. One of the things that is a reality is that that is exacerbated by uncertainty is the fact that we are operating in a trust crisis. Our buyers, no matter how high an integrity organization we hold and no matter how much our buyers trust us in individual people or an individual business, they are making decisions on a basis of no trust. And on the next slide that we'll go to, you'll see that there's some really um, what I would call challenging data that's come out of the Edelman Trust Barometer. If you don't um, follow this report, it's something I look at it every year because I find it really, really helpful in understanding the general economic context by which that we're going to be operating as marketers and business leaders and and women in business. And unfortunately, the news is not very good that trust continues to erode at a very, very high rate. And in fact, um, a global audience that is surveyed as part of this process showed that trust has actually degraded in business leaders seven points this last year. And this was done towards the end of 2022. So this is definitely the context by which we're operating in. And it creates challenges for us because no matter what we do, no matter what we offer, no matter what the guarantees are that are out there, our buyers and their finance people who approve purchases and their accounting teams who are deciding on cash management are operating at a stage where they don't fundamentally trust the promises that any business is giving them. And so we have to work extra hard at overcoming that. And on the next slide, I'll give you just a little bit of an example of how this really plays out for us. The reality is if people don't trust us, it doesn't matter so much anything else that we do. No matter what we communicate, no matter what we offer, people are giving us money for something or they're giving us their time or they're making a donation to our nonprofit. They expect to have some kind of trusted relationship with us. And a lack of trust affects us, especially in moments of uncertainty. Um, at the peak of the pandemic, which uh, is thankfully a little bit behind us, um, we had made a very difficult decision that my adult child would not be coming home for Thanksgiving. And I was truly devastated by this. This is a really hard, Thanksgiving is my absolute favorite holiday of all the holidays. It was the first Thanksgiving ever that they weren't coming home, um, but it was just too complicated and we decided not to do that. Uh, they also don't cook. And I was feeling like really sad for them that they weren't going to be able to eat a home cooked meal. And I was feeling sad for myself. And so, um, but I remembered earlier, I had used Harry and David to deliver a holiday meal to a nephew of mine who lives on the West Coast. I'm here outside of Boston um, and they did an amazing job and I was really excited. So it was actually on Halloween um, when I was sitting around waiting for trick-or-treaters to come get candy that this was sort of all spewing around in my head. And so I placed an order that day for a Thanksgiving meal to get delivered to my kiddo. And I was feeling better about things. At least we'd be on video and be able to do this. So long before Thanksgiving, well, something happened um, because it was the pandemic um, there ended up being a turkey shortage because turkey producers were used to growing large turkeys for big gatherings. And all of a sudden, lots of people were staying home and trying to buy smaller turkeys and buying more of them. So the number of turkeys, um, if not the weight of pounds of turkey consumed, was going up dramatically. Um, I wasn't terribly concerned. I'd read a little article about it, but I had placed my order so early. I'd gotten all my confirmations. All was well. And I was brilliant. I decided to ship this order so that it would be delivered on the Tuesday before um, Thanksgiving instead of Wednesday. So if there was a shipping delay, there'd be a buffer in there. And I was feeling really good. Well, on Monday, I noticed the um, order hadn't shipped. So I called Harry and David and they informed me at that time that they were out of turkeys and would not be sending my meal to which I completely lost my mind. <laughs> and um, I did what every frustrated uh, consumer does these days. I went to Twitter and I tweeted them. And in fairness to them, they responded right away and I got a hold of somebody and we had what I thought was a really good conversation. And they said, you know what? We are out of turkeys, but we have everything else. How are you open to swapping out a roast beef instead of turkey? And I was like, absolutely. I'll pout a little bit, but I don't think turkey is the point. It's all the things that go together. 
So I um, signed off on doing that, but I said, are you sure it's still gonna get there? Without going into all the gory details, the end of the day, that meal did not arrive, despite multiple promises that Harry and Dade made, despite very nice customer service agents who were very sympathetic to my situation, but fundamentally there was a breakdown in process. I had walked into the scenario really trusting Harry and David to do something really important to me to deliver memories and to connect me to my kiddo, um, like they had connected me to my nephew before, and they completely lost my trust. Um, that's the scenarios that we face. Now, that was an emotionally draining experience because it was over a holiday during the pandemic, but every day in all the ways that we serve our customers, we have opportunities to help not break those bonds and not bake trust. There were a lot of things that Harry and David could have done differently, including proactive communication to warn me about the situation. A week before they knew that they were gonna be running short on turkeys, they could have approved and asked me to swap out the roast beef and actually get it on time. Now to Harry and David's credit, I do wanna say they gave me a full refund and the meal did arrive, but it arrived days after Thanksgiving. Um, I found a, bake, uh, a backup plan. I called every restaurant within 10 mile radius and I found one that would pre-order a meal for my kiddo. And so Thanksgiving was saved, my heart, not so much. Um, but I use that as an example because it's a really good example of when our buyers are frustrated, when they're under stress, building trust is incredibly important. And right now, whether our own businesses or not, our community of people that we serve are feeling a little bit stressed and frustrated and uncertain. And so we have that higher barrier. If you want to go to the next slide, what we talk about is during these times and always, it's good practice. We have to worry a little bit less about creating scale and more about creating relationships. And this is really counter to sometimes how we go about our businesses. We're looking to automate a process. We're looking to streamline our communications. We're looking to make things um, less costly for us as a business because we maybe are tightening things a little bit. We're worried about cash flow a little bit. And so we have to balance that with the need to get personal with the people that we serve. And the next slide, please. So we're going to talk about five things that we can proactively do to help secure our businesses in times of uncertainty and of um, financial concerns around recession. One of those things is we have a community of people who already trust us. They are our networks that we've built, our existing customers. Far too often, almost every bit of our marketing resources goes to finding new customers. It does not go to serving the customers that we have. Yet there's this rich opportunity to take advantage of the trust that already exists. If you go to the next slide, you'll see this reinforced in the Edelman research. So earlier I showed you an example of some pretty sad data that tells us how much people don't trust us. But here's the good news. People are improving the trust they have. They're increasing trust. It's actually growing with their very local community, the people they work with and the people that they live nearby. That's good news for us because that means it doesn't necessarily mean geographically we are near our customers. Some of our businesses are very far from where our customers reside, but the connections of our customers and how they can talk about us and what they can do is very real. That means things like referral programs, word of mouth, advocacy, partnership can go a long way towards addressing existing customers and finding ways to upsell things to them to help sustain us where it might be a little bit more challenging to earn the trust of a brand new customer. If you wanna to go to the next slide, I wanna talk an example about another approach that addresses customer marketing really critically for the people that already trust us. And this is around partnerships. What you'll see on the screen is actually from my local uh, city's Facebook uh, group. Many of you probably have something similar. And someone posted uh, a post here about uh, this really local chocolate business that does a lot of yummy confections. Valentine's Day was coming up. This was posted a couple of days ago. And they have a really uh, small online shop. They have a very local business. They hand deliver products to, to folks. But something interesting happened in my city um, over the last couple of weeks. We had a teacher strike. And that teacher strike created a lot of emotions across our community. And a lot of people, hundreds of people were showing up to do demonstrations, 
students are back in school and the strike is technically over, but there's a lot of sort of general desire to help inform and keep teachers and let them know how much we value them as part of our community. We're still reeling from students having a week of not being in school. And so um, this checklist business did something very smart. They attached to this idea in a positive way. And they said, hey, um, teachers have to do fundraising because part of that strike, the teachers were fined for city expenses associated with being out of school for a week. And so they, Woburn Teachers Association, that has a lot of following right now and has a lot of activity right now, was raising money. And so this very small chocolate business said, hey, we've got Valentine's Day going up. It's a big opportunity for me to increase sales for my community. And I'm going to attach to this thing that was happening across the city. And I'm going to donate a percentage of my funds to that. And not only did they do that, but I don't know if you can tell, this post was actually shared specifically by Support Woburn Teachers, which has a huge and very active following right now, a much bigger following than this little chocolate shop has traditionally had. It was a smart way to go with people that were trusted and attached to that and help secure um, business for them. And they had some awesome record sales. On the next slide, I want to transition our conversation and talk about the second thing that we need to do. We need to talk about pricing for profit. Now, I really do believe that for most businesses, pricing for profitability versus just growth is generally a healthy thing for us to do. But there are times when we want to focus on um, particularly around uh, growth or numbers of customers or going into a new market and other things. But when we're facing economic uncertainty or potential slowdowns, we have to remember that if we don't survive those slowdowns in those times, long-term growth doesn't matter. And so it's critically important that we look at our pricing strategies during this time. Our buyers are going to be more finicky with their, with their pricing and their approvals for purchases as well. If you go to the next slide, there's multiple aspects of pricing that we need to be looking at. Because not only do we need to protect our own business and the cash that we have in our business to get through what might be a, a difficult time, but we also need to realize that our customers and our buyers are thinking through those things. There's some great data out there that shows us purchase decisions are taking longer, right? We've seen, I see anecdotally all the time, average sales prices are going down. Um, people are pushing off a purchase. So maybe they had planned to buy it in February, but they're going to kind of stall until April or May and kind of get by with what they're doing. And so there's things that we can control to help optimize our go-to-market. One of the things we might want to look at, for example, is things around value-based packaging. In this picture, you'll see ketchup, Heinz ketchup. Um, I happen to like Heinz ketchup, but I just picked on this because this was something that was actually talked about in Heinz's um, earnings report, that they were looking at value packaging where they're actually selling um, ketchup in bulk. It's an item that people can store a lot. It can, doesn't really go bad for a long time. It has a big shelf life and it's a, sort of a commodity product that people use a lot of. So they have tapped into this idea of this sort of bulk pricing as something that they want to do um, more and more. And we see that um, because they are expecting people to um, be a little bit more conscious of how much they're spending in some of their food and things as, as their um, belts get a little tightened. We also want to look at things like in our inventory. Do we have um, uh, products that, that we normally order that are sort of loss leaders that come in? We don't make money at them, but they bring foot traffic to our store or they drive traffic to our website or they get people in there. So we need to look at how much of that we want. And instead, how much can we focus on high margin products or services? We also should look at things like bundling. Do we have inventory of items that um, are really high demand and lots of people continue to want, or maybe there's increased demand for them over the recession? Sometimes people want different products or services from us. Can we attach high profit add-ons onto those in a way? So we not only need to look at what we're charging for things, but how are we packaging and bundling products together to optimize our profitability? And then lastly, we really need to look at cash management. This is particularly important for things that are like service businesses. I have lots of different types of services that I offer um, for different organizations. Some drive cash up front and some have very long delayed cash payment cycles. I need to be thinking about all the things that are coming into my business 
and prioritize projects that are going to keep enough cash flowing to help me through any slowdowns that might be coming. Next slide, please. The third thing that I want us to think about is looking at things that are entry level offerings. So for those customers, we talked about how hard it is to bring new customers in when people are uncertain and they're um, trying right now to kind of stay as tried and true to what they already know as possible. And if you go to the next slide, I'm going to give you two examples of what I'm doing for my own business in this area. But all of us should be doing things like this. So I run a marketing consulting practice. I have highly personalized offers, um, many of which have significant investments in time. And so I've never really offered things on my website that you could directly buy because it wasn't really well suited for the type of business that I ran. But recently I've realized that there is an opportunity for me to change that and to get introduced into customers and buyers with some lower cost, less risky things that buyers might want to do to get to know me and new ways that I can serve my community. One of those ways is an on-demand class. So I run a lot of live workshops for folks, and those are a significant investment for usually a company to do that. But there's this opportunity for me to say, you know what, people might be a little hesitant to invest in that big course right now, but they still want to learn. So can I teach them something of value for $100 instead of $10,000 and build a relationship with them that maybe over time will grow into something else. But even if it doesn't grow into something else, I've at least now found a offering that I can give to them that is uh, appropriate for my business. Similarly, I do a lot of custom marketing planning with organizations, and that can is often a very expensive endeavor. It includes a lot of research. It includes a lot of uh, collaboration and working together and expertise. But sometimes people want to just come to me and they have a plan and they just want a little bit of advice. So can I get to know people and have an offering that is much lower uh, again, risk for the person who's making a purchase. And so on my website now, there's a plan review. And for just a couple hundred bucks, we schedule some time together and I go through your plan and I can give you some expert advice and input. And sometimes that's just like marketing therapy, sort of validation for what you're doing and it makes people feel good. But we always come up with new ideas and new things that they can use in their business as well. And you can go to my website and you can click on this and you could actually pay for it and book it right there. This is something that I hadn't done before because I thought of my business through a different lens, but I now have the opportunity to, and all of our businesses have the opportunity to find things like this that we can do. And if you want to go to the next slide, the other, the fourth thing that I want us to think about is distribution channels for our products and our services. What are things that we can do to help us get in front of an audience and it may be a different way with what we're doing right now. And if you go to the next slide, I'm gonna talk about a small business. It's called Time at the Farm. Um, they are near my lake house. It's a charming little store and they make tons of handmade bath and body products, soaps and lotions and perfumes. And then they also retail some other items that are um, in the store. And I had a chat, I'm friendly with the woman who owns the shop. I go there quite often. Um, and we've done some fun stuff together and um, I really love their products and they happen to sell a cologne that um, is the only cologne my son likes to wear. So um, I go there often when I need my San Barville cologne fix. And I was talking to the shop owner actually um, and she was telling me how slow traffic is. So she's on a major highway, but um, going to a very resort area. And overall tourism down in the White Mountains is, is just down right now. And it's down for a couple of reasons. One is there's snow in the mountains, but there hasn't been a lot of snow in a lot of the communities and they're a big ski area. But also that we are um, in, the, uh, in a time where people are a little uncertain about the economy. And so overall tourism in doubt. And so traffic in her store is way, way down. So she's done a couple of things to help address this. So one of the things she does is she runs these craft classes where she teaches people to make candles or we did a paint project. They have in the store a lot of handcrafted wooden carved items. She, she creates those and then we paint them and she does a whole bunch of um, interesting things around that. And that's been a way to sort of sustain her while the store is very closed. 
Well, the other thing we talked about is, are there a couple of high selling items that she can repackage and relabel without changing what the product is or changing her supplies? She can use inventory she already is that's not turning over in the store to create an Etsy shop. So that's something that she's going to be doing. It doesn't cost her much. She already has inventory that's not turning over, but it's a new channel for her. And she has the kind of products where Etsy happens to be the best place for that. In other businesses, it might through be through Amazon, or it might be through lots of other types of channels. But thinking about the channels that we distribute our products to is another strategy for getting through challenging financial times. And then the fifth one, if you want to go to the next slide, is all about removing purchase friction from the buying process. When we get buyers in, we want to do our best to not scare them away. We want to make sure they're hanging out with us and they're staying with us. And if you go to the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about a, a situation that happened to me very, very recently. So I have run my own business for about 11 years now, almost exactly 11 years. And almost most of that time, I have used an electronic signature software company for my contracts. Now, I, I'm a small business. I don't have a lot of contracts, but I found the tool to be helpful. I pay a few hundred dollars a year and I'm happy with the service and it's been fine. I don't use most of the features of the service, but it does what I want competently and makes that part of my buying process seamless and easy for my customers. And that's important to me. Well, they just notified me that they were increasing their pricing. And so I was like, oh, giving me a moment of pause. I'm thinking about maybe there's going to be a slowdown with recession. And so many people in my space in the tech industry have been laid off, which is a big portion of my business, not exclusively, but it feeds a lot of my business. And so I looked at all of that and um, I was sort of uh, hesitating, but I hadn't reached out to them, but they did something really smart. They saw the level of activities and they sent me an email saying, hey, we have increased our prices, but we have the starter pack that we think is perfect for you. Thinking this is brilliant. That's perfect. It's probably all I need. Great. I'm interested. And I'm expecting them to send me the pricing for it in the click. Well, they don't. They um, have some a person reach out. I can tell it's a real person from the way that they're communicating with me. And they tell me to set up a meeting. I'm like, I don't have time for a meeting. Just give me the price and I'm just going to buy it. It'll be fine because it'll be less one of the price. And I was sort of borderline considering playing the higher price anyways. Well, that person wouldn't do it and uh, wouldn't do it without a meeting. And, you know, somehow this per the, they have some internal process issues that are creating unnecessary friction. This person is probably paid by the meeting, not by the sale. So they've created this barrier of thing that we don't need. So... I tell them, look, I'm just not going to do it. I, I, I don't need the service very well. There are other ways that I can get signatures, never mind. And I go in and I turn off auto renew on my software package. And I kind of expected someone else to reach out. Well, three weeks went by and nobody reached out, but eventually somebody did. I'm coming against the date where they actually will be renewed. I'm a week or two away. And somebody else reached out and said, hey, we realized that you didn't um, renew. You turned off auto renew with us. Would you like to, uh, we, we hate to see you go. And I said, great. I just want to know the starter pack pricing and I'll buy it. They still wouldn't give me the information. So I've turned off the service. I'm not going to move forward. They did something really smart. They segmented their database. They looked at the audience. They knew a service might be good. They paid attention to their customers. And then they created all these friction points in buying that didn't need to be there and really turned me off. We need to assess all the places that we are creating friction points unnecessarily and often unintentionally and remove those. Because when people are on the fence about whether I'm going to keep something or not or buy something, these things will stop them from moving forward. On the next section of the slide, if you want to move forward, we're going to talk about a little bonus one I have for you, a sixth thing I want to talk about, which is smart segmentation. If you go to the next slide, I want to talk about segmentation because it is incredibly important as we're looking at how we thrive in times of uncertainty. And it is about getting very focused on our target audience. So. I will just tell you a very short version of a painful experience I had in my career that is relevant here. Um, many years ago, I was working for a startup and we were um, launching a new product to market. We had no paying customers yet. And we had a very, very high-end product that competed in a very competitive, mature market space. And we were attracting, um, and we were doing a good job of setting up meetings with 
senior executives at really big telcos and banks and real to companies. I walked into my sales review meeting feeling really positive. We were very, very excited about it. We went through all that process and the CEO co-founder of the company looks at me and goes, eh, it's all right. I'm like, what do you mean? Eh, it's all right. We've been meeting with all these people. What are you talking about? What's going on? Well, as um, I got really upset, we didn't have a very productive conversation of being honest. I went home, I ate a big bowl of chocolate ice cream because that's how I um, do everything. I celebrate with chocolate ice cream. I am sad with chocolate ice cream. My husband was like, what's going on? I was pouting, I was whining, and then I went to bed. And when I really woke up and I thought about it for a moment and I cleared my head, I realized, let me go back and think about why he's saying this. And he was right. Because we were talking to the right industries and the right people at those companies, but we needed people who were early adopters. And there wasn't a way for me to buy a list of early adopters. And so we had to say, well, how do we actually attract early adopters, not just people in these industries, not just people who have these jobs to us? And we changed some things that we were doing to be able to do that. In times of recession, in times of financial uncertainty, we need to figure out who can we best serve and who is most likely going to buy our product or service, and we need to focus our attention on them. In this case, I took a bunch of the existing content that we already had, and I reframed the title of that content so it's attracting the right people. And I added qualification questions into the process of meeting acquisition to make sure we were spending time with the right people. All of our businesses need to do that healthy segmentation. You go to the next slide. It reminds us that we can't actually create urgency. I used to believe rather naively early in my career that I could make buyers skip parts of their buying process and I could make them need my product. And it, as much as that may occasionally happen, and maybe we fool people once in a while, the truth is we can't do that. But what we can do is understand what different segments of our community care about and what they do feel is urgent and must have right now. And we can position our products or services around those needs. If you go into the next slide, you'll see an example of this in action. General Mills um, he put, had a recent uh, earnings announcement as well. I told you about Heinz earlier, and this one really caught my attention as well because they recognize their market segmentation. When there's a recession, people eat at home more than they eat in restaurants. That means they're anticipating their restaurant orders, which is some of their biggest customers, to have a reduced need for their product. But that means people are cooking at home more. So how are they going to focus and strategize and target that at-home cook more than they maybe were investing in some of the restaurant things that they were doing during this economic uncertainty? So it doesn't matter what our business is. It's a service business like mine, a big technology business like that example I was just sharing with you where we needed to find early adopters, a consumer product like this, a a uh, specialty boutique retail company like Time at the Farm, we can and should understand what our customers want right now and move forward to focus our segmentation on that. If you go to the next slide, I just want to talk a little bit about a couple of things. So how do we know who to focus on? In the next slide, you'll see a whole bunch of factors for us to take into account. There's internal things, Who? what does it cost us to serve different communities? How perceived of an expert are we in those spaces? Is it? Do we have a good and healthy database of people to communicate to? Are we more profitable in some markets than other because our cost to acquire is less or the service that we have to deliver is easier? Where are we already known? These are things that will help us narrow down the segmentation that we should focus on. And if you go to the next slide, you need to then complement data analysis with qualitative research. And there is no better time to do this than when your markets are shifting or changing. They could be shifting and changing because you're growing. The recession spurs bigger need for your product or shifting and growing because things are slowing down. And qualitative research is the art of talking to people and not it's not about a survey. It's about going out there and doing that. And there's a lot of research, including a study that I've done, that shows us that when we add qualitative research, we do a better job of matching buyers 
with urgent understanding their urgent needs and matching our product or service to the right collection of buyers and then better at attracting them and convincing them to move forward with us. And there's reasons why qualitative research has to complement the data analysis that we all do. When we're talking to someone, their tone of voice tells us something that we wouldn't know simply by an answer from a question. Conversations allow us to have back and forth. We can ask for clarification. Data tells us what people are doing, but it doesn't tell us why. And if we understand why, we can be more powerful in the offerings that we put together. People will also say things that they don't always put in writing. So we often get these really important moments of clarity and insight. They're also more spontaneous in their verbal responses and they might be in a written response. And so when we combine the power of really understanding where we make money with understanding what is really important and urgent to my buying community right now, we can be really smart about the packages and bundles that we put together. And if you go to the next slide, I just want to remind us, so we talked about a lot of things, six things that we should be doing with our business, everything from thinking about our pricing to how we segment to market. It's a lot and it can be a little scary when things are tight, when we're not sure where cash is coming from, or sometimes when there's just huge growth opportunity and we don't want to miss it. And we're a little afraid that we're going to, we have this short-term window to do great things. I mean, think about Zoom. During the pandemic, Zoom had huge growth because all of a sudden there was a massive increase in need. It must have been a little scary to sit in those board moves and worry about missing that opportunity. Other products didn't get the same level of growth and benefit that Zoom did, even though they offer a similar service. And so there's pressure to do that. What I want us to remember is that we can make mistakes and we will make mistakes. What we have to do, especially in times when the base context of operating is uncertainty and distrust, is we can't be mediocre. People don't fall in love with mediocre. And if we want them to buy from us right now, we want to optimize our market opportunities so that we can survive through these changes and thrive through and after, we have to make sure to be really stand out. So with that, if you'd like to go to the next slide, I'll just leave you with some contact information. I have a resource library on the website that has a ton of resources that I hope you'll find useful, but I'd also like to pause and just open it up for questions and comments. Sam, that was absolutely fantastic. So much good actionable information. Uh, and on top of that, folks, this is your opportunity. You've got the marketing expert here at your fingertips, so to speak. If you have a question, please use the Q&A function to send us a question. And I just did want to let everyone know that the program is being recorded and you will have access to it later. So you can go back over those really interesting aspects of it. Um, we're going to start right off with, we have a question. Where, <laughs> I like this one. Uh, somebody is asking if there is some kind of serial index so we can figure out when the recessions are coming. <laughs> <laughs> that would be really smart. I love that. And I know we packed so much into this conversation because uh, I talk really fast. I'm from New England and I had a lot to share. Um, I would, there probably is. I would bet you there is a serial index in there or something like that. That is a more general food index, but I'm not, I, I have no idea how you would find that. <laughs> but uh, it was interesting to me when I was looking at earnings reports, I did purposely go out and look at a few different companies to try and get a sense of how are people preparing. And it is interesting that the food industry in particular is really very proactively projecting where things are going to go and planning. And that has to do with the long lead cycles they have on inventory management. Oh, terrific. All right. Our next question is, what is the best way to figure out who to have those qualitative research interviews with? I am so glad that someone asked that question because we get this wrong a lot. A lot of times we interview people who are the easiest for us to interview. Um, and they are people who know us very well. Now there is value in talking to your longtime customers. And I always encourage people to do that. You learn things. But if you're trying to really understand um, attracting new people to you, um, you also want to talk to non-customers that are in your highly attractive segment. So earlier I showed a whole bunch of data and we didn't have time to go through it in detail, but figure out where you're going to um, be the best serve, make the most profit right now. Who needs that? 
um, narrow it down to a pool of maybe three, four choices, and then go out and do the qualitative research you need to determine which of those is most likely to succeed. Talk to existing customers, talk to non-customers, but make sure they're not just people that are easy for you to reach, but they actually represent the audience that you're trying to serve and go after. One of the places that I find the fastest and most value is people I just lost business to, people who decided not to pursue working with me or people who decided to use an alternative approach or just didn't proceed at all. Because understanding what kept them from moving forward is really instrumental. So combination of people who decided they didn't go forward and people who have and trying to understand what is motivating each of those types of behaviors. So you can find more people like, like the ones that move forward. Okay. Our next question is, if you are a service-based business in the high-end luxury market, is there a tip you have on how to motivate buyers for high-ticket items right now or just getting them to make a decision? You know, it's a really good question, and I think it's a um, really big challenge for us. So first of all, I think um, segmentation becomes really important. The recession doesn't affect everybody equally, and there's probably some portions of your community that are, um, you know, they will continue to buy no matter what. They're not going to have these frustration concerns or it's not important to them. So what can we do? So for example, I'm just making up this particular example, but it, it illustrates the point. Um, if I sell very, very high-end face creams, right? I sell very expensive um, creams for faces. It's considered a luxury item. I, um, a person who's tight on budget isn't going to go out and, and spend that money. Who are the people whose appearance matters so much to them that they are willing to move forward no matter what or have the financial equity and focus my efforts around that audience? The second thing is to think about, can I create a lower-end product with that is going to appeal maybe to a different audience than that. It's not going to cannibalize my audience. It's going to serve a different audience. And can I do that in a way um, that is cost effective and maybe test out a lower end market? And so you can't make people buy luxury items if they're if they're not ready. Um, but you can figure out who wants it most and focus your attention there. And like I said, consider a more entry-level offering if you have it to sort of give them a taste for what you provide. And um, hopefully over time that, that might provide a new market for you. And then the last thing I would just say on that is that point I made about distribution channels. Who can you partner with? Who can you do things with? I'll give you a real bartering example that it happened with me just a couple of weeks ago. I've launched those new courses I told you about. I need to advertise those courses, but I don't want to spend a lot of money on creating ads. Um, and so I found an ad agency that a woman that I've known for many years, they're fantastic. I really respect what they do. And she needed something that I do uniquely, which is around um, building out the segmentation and research. And so I'm going to do that work for her and she's going to create ads for me, right? And so we can get creative in understanding um, where we can distribute our products and services so that um, we are getting the most um, value. Right. Our next question, question actually refers back to your Harry and David story. What can they do to get back your trust after they've already lost it? It's an excellent question. And I've been actually thinking a lot about that. And I, I, um, I don't know the answer direct. I, I, I was really emotionally um, really distraught over what happened. And I'm not sure that I'm the kind of person is worth them earning back. So let me just start by saying it may not be worth their effort to do that in this particular case. I didn't buy a lot from them before. I would once, you know, every couple of years buy something. But let's say I was a more regular customer and they really did want to get that back. Um, I think personal outreach from someone on the team making a phone call and speaking to me um, and being really empathetic would have helped. I think um, offering maybe to donate food to a food shelter that I care about might have um, helped me earn trust, um, giving me a really low cost way to try them again and a less risky, less intense emotional experience um, proactively might be a way for me to, to build trust with them again. So I don't think it's impossible. I don't hate them. Um, but they're going to have to do a lot to earn that back. Makes sense. Absolutely makes sense. Uh, we have time probably for one more question today. And, uh, I think, uh, 
I think this uh, this one is actually a really good one for this particular audience. Uh, women often have a lot of difficulty asking for what they're worth. Do you have any tips on making sure that you are asking for what you're worth? This is such a great question. And this is particularly um, challenging right now. I was telling Bobby before we taped that I've had a lot of people reaching out asking me to speak for free. And um, I speak for free in many scenarios where that is um, good for me and good for a community. But if somebody is charging people to attend an event and they um, ask me to speak as an attraction for that, event, I expect compensation for that event. Well, I'm hearing a lot of, well, we don't have budget for it. Things are tight. I'm not sure. And I've had to take a deep breath and decide what am I worth and when do I want to give away my time and when do I not want to give away my time? And I need to figure out what fees I want to spend in, in those communities. And it's not always easy to do that, right? It's hard to stand up for the things we want. Um, I get comfort in understanding um, what it is worth. So I do work. I look at salaries.com. I look what other people are charging. I look around. And so I do know what I'm worth. So number one is a lot of people think they know, but they don't really. So do your homework, make sure you're walking into a conversation with confidence to know what people are getting paid for the work that you do and the things that you do. And then um, take a deep breath and just ask. Um, the worst that's gonna happen is somebody says no, but um, you are just as likely to get a yes. Um, and so, um, I find different people's personalities, di different things. For me, I just need to write myself a few notes and I walk into a meeting and I'm ready to go. Other people, I think, are better off if they put it in writing in a written communication and ask for a meeting. That's a technique I've used with a lot of women who struggle with conflict and they perceive this as conflict. Um, putting it down in writing, sending it with respect and polite, and then asking for a meeting sometimes opens the door for something they're not willing to say. Um, find a good mentor that you trust that can advocate for you within the organization you work for. I've had a lot of situations where I've had a young woman, um, actually sometimes very experienced women who have a lot of experience, some years, more years experience me, come to me say, it's like, I just, you know, I'm kind of stuck and I, I see you and you've grown so fast and I really, I, what are you doing? And um, I can be a help and an advocate for them to help speak on their behalf to people that I have a good relationship with. So Use whatever it takes. Just, um, I, you know, I really encourage people to do the asking. Our counterparts are not afraid to ask. Um, and um, when I lived in West Africa growing up, there was a saying, people would often ask us for Monday. They would, there was a phrase at the time, they would say, give me my Friday. And it was like, basically, I, you know, can you help make my day? Give me some money. And, it, and my, my father was famous for saying, I'll give you your Friday, you give me my Sunday. Um, and uh, he'd always get a, get a laugh. But, you know, even if we didn't, then they would go, oh, you don't ask, you don't get. Like, it was just a culturally accepted way of doing things. And I, that has stuck with me my whole life, right? If we don't ask for things, we're not going to get them. The universe sometimes puts greatness in front of us and is a gift, but most cases we have to ask for it. So practice asking um, and find whatever communication style works for you. Fantastic. So I am going to once again, share Sam's contact information. We've also dropped it into the chat. Uh, so you can access her special offerings, uh, her classes or her plan review. And Sam, you know, as we kind of end up today, any last tips uh, for our audience? Yeah, thank you. I would just say that I think um, we are sometimes afraid to act until it's almost too late. We don't want to over project a slowdown or we just, you know, good things are happening and we get so busy, we can't keep up with it. So we don't think ahead. But I would tell you that if you aren't taking that moment of pause and talking to your customers and doing a check-in and just seeing where you're at, please do that because things are shifting and changing, good and bad, and we need to know about it. And the more proactive you are in preparing and planning for it, the better off you're going to be and be able to do really amazing things in 2023 and have a fantastic year in whatever that looks like for you. Excellent. Thank you so much and appreciate very much your doing our kickoff event here at Lioness Magazine. Um, Lioness Magazine is owned by Innovation Women, 
And uh, we are also uh, sharing a survey in the chat. So we put that link in the chat. We want to hear from you. Tell us what is helpful for you. Tell us what we can do to help you. Give us feedback, obviously, on how today went for you. Was it helpful for you? Was it not helpful? And what are the things that we can do here at Lioness to create programming for our Lioness community? So thanks again, Samantha Stone. Awesome job. Amazing. So glad you could join us here today. And uh, we hope to see you all very soon. See you next month at our networking event. Thank you.